So, um, without further ado, um, Matteo, uh, he will, Matteo Corsellini, he will uh, chair this meeting. The floor is yours. Okay, Boris, thank you very much. Good afternoon, good morning, you all, wherever you are. And I'm very pleased to chair today's session and introduce our very special guest, Professor Zachary Kahlo. So, very quickly, Zachary Kahlo is Professor of Law at Hamad bin Khalifa University, and I hope I've not misspelled it. He's also a research scholar in law and religion at Valparaiso University, fellow at Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory University, visiting professor at the Open University UK, and adjunct professor at Notre Dame Law School Australia, and the list goes on. Well, worth of mention is that Zachary Kahl is also a legal professional, as he practiced law at Buckley Sandler LLP in Washington, DC. And today he's gonna talk about human dignity beyond human. And just as a quick reminder after his talk, we're gonna have approximately between 25 to 30 minutes for discussion. And I'd be more than happy to pick up all your questions. So with that being said, and we know for the due, Professor Carlo, please, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Matteo. And uh, thank you also to, to Boris for the invitation and, and for making these arrangements and, uh, and Isabella for, for her assistance. And, I should also send my my thanks in abstention to uh, to Marco Ventura, who who can't be with us, but uh, he was the one who, in fact, uh, some months ago, introduced me to to this project. And uh, uh, I wish we could be doing this in person in in Trento, but uh, the universe had had other plans for us. It seems. Uh, just one one quick caveat. I, I guess we're we're reaching uh, a state of affairs where it's now expected that you have slides. But but I confess, I'm I'm something of a luddite. When it comes to these things, and and so I don't have any any slides with texts or pictures or really much of anything for you. So you're just going to have to uh, endure my smiling face uh, for this chat. Um, so I apologize if that causes undue uh, undue sadness. But uh, let me uh, let me jump in. Um, there, there's several things I want to take up today, but but the main concern is is to use the concept of of human dignity to look at ethical debates about technology and the, and, and the human future, we, we might broadly say. And, and I'm particularly interested in looking at how this language of dignity illuminates themes within uh, transhuman and posthuman discourse and religious responses uh, to posthumanism. I, I should perhaps also now add uh, a, a caveat, which is that when, when I talk about religion today, what, what I really will have in mind is constructive Christian theology, um, mainly for, for just for the, for the limitations of what we can, can cover, though, though I would say there is, I think, some very uh, interesting and important work that needs to be done looking at these questions uh, comparatively, but, but today I won't, uh, I won't do that. Um, I should also add that my, my interest, or at least the methodology that I'm going to, to employ, isn't much concerned with technology as such, at least in the sense we might say of, of kind of looking at the feasibility of, of various uh, propositions. I sort of put this off to the side and, and take uh, transhuman and posthuman discourses on their own terms, and even in their most uh, fantastical articulations, because I think, at least in this respect, pushing the conversation to the extremes is, is somewhat illuminating, at least in the ways that I would like to explore them. So my, my aim here isn't so much to, to advance some kind of normative perspective on, if we want to call it this, the post-human project, but rather to use this as a way of interrogating what it tells us about how we understand and negotiate and debate uh, dignity and, and personhood. So the premise, I mean, it's a rather simple premise, but the premise with which I'll begin is that the moral anthropology of posthumanism stands in some measure of deep, maybe even ineluctable tension with religious accounts uh, of the same. And in discourses of posthumanism and the religious responses, we have these two quite possibly irreconcilable accounts of dignity. I, I don't want to fully overstate the point. There are all kinds of points of convergence, and, and I'll look at those in, in, uh, in the end of my remarks. But I at least want to begin by proposing that at the level of anthropology, we, we have fundamentally different worldviews concerning human nature, human goods, 
uh, and uh, and human ends. Now, the way that I want to uh, kind of organize my my time today is uh, beginning by introducing just some basic themes that I see as informing what we might call post-human dignity and theological dignity. Uh, from there, I want to delve a bit more deeply into uh, three particular instantiations or expressions um, of these worldviews in aspects of human nature uh, and human experience that I think are particularly important. And that is going to be the body, uh, the notion of risk, uh, and the concept of relationality. And, uh, and then by way of bringing things to, to a conclusion, uh, I'll offer some remarks about where all this might have us going with respect to the larger relationship between religion and posthumanism. And I think as well, this, this has certainly some broader implications uh, for an engagement with, with biotechnology in, in a more general sense. So beginning, um, for, for many advocates of using technology to radically reshape or transform human nature, this, this, this intervention is, is defined as dignity enhancing. That is, uh, not only are these interventions morally permissible, they are morally imperative. And this will be contrasted with what is often called a bioconservative view that views such interventions as violative of the dignity that arises from human nature. And to alter this nature, certainly in, in the ways proposed to enhance human, human capabilities is, is a violation of dignity. So we have this, this immediate dignitarian divide over, over conceptualization. Now, this language of post-human dignity is, is most commonly associated with the work of Nicholas Bostrom, who has argued uh, in, in any number of, of venues that making persons more intelligent, more self-controlled, more immune from debilitation and disease, more liberated from uh, the, the drudgeries of work and of labor, uh, and even perhaps freed from the grip of death itself, is to make persons more dignified. So just a, an exemplary statement of this position, he, he proposes that it is possible that through enhancement, we can become better able to appreciate the many forms of dignity that are overlooked or missing under our current conditions. So technology then becomes not a source of, of tyranny, but it is a source of betterment, of liberation, of, of enhancing dignity. So to put the point somewhat differently, I think as, as Bostrom and certainly many of, of his cohorts would see the matter, dignity isn't a intrinsic character. It is not something that is given by or from human nature as such. It is something that is gained, something we might say that is achieved through improving the human condition. And indeed, if anything, nature is not the, it's not the locus of human dignity. Human nature is a barrier to dignity. It is a barrier to becoming more dignified. So I think we could say that dignity, at least in this, in this uh, post-human dignity sense of understanding, is something that goes through nature, or even we might say around nature. So nature as bequeathed is an obstacle to a more dignified existence. And then this notion of dignification, we could call it, is a project. It's an ongoing, never-ending project of improvement. This we might contrast with what I call the, the bioconservative position, that in Bostrom's own phrasing, tends to deny post-human dignity and view post-humanity as a threat to human dignity. And Leon Cass, I'll offer as, I think, a representative uh, exponent of this position. And in a quite striking passage, Cass writes the following of various biotechnological advances. He describes them as posing a threat to the dignity of nascent human life, the dignity of psychic integrity, the dignity of human self-command, the dignity of human activity and human excellence, the dignity of living deliberately and self-consciously. So what undergirds Cass's dignitarian concerns is a view of human nature as fixed, and indeed nature as itself a, a bearer of normativity. So there is a givenness to the human inheritance that makes claims upon us. And so to go radically beyond this inheritance is itself an affront 
to the dignity that is unique to human persons. And we might even go further and, and see that these limits, these limits that define our nature, including the final limitations of suffering and death, become essential to our humanness, essential to our dignity. And so for Cass, they are not things to be overcome, things to be improved upon, but rather they are to be taken as a site for moral reflection on what it means to live well as creatures, limited creatures of a certain sort. And so we have this kind of interesting paradox, if you will, that these aspects of humanity that at first glance might seem to be indices of our not being dignified, our deficiencies, our debilitations, uh, the inevitability of our death become essential to living life with dignity. Now, this, this bioconservative position is not, it, it, by any means, strictly speaking, a religious perspective, although there is, uh, I think it's fair to say, significant overlap in, in positions and perspectives. So just by way of example, uh, an article published uh, quite recently in uh, Studies in Christian Ethics uh, opens with the very first words being simply, transhumanism is satanic. And the author, uh, Brandon Gallagher, a, uh, an English theologian, uh, writes that transhumanism is characterized by self-worship or the self-deification of humanity. In other words, it seems to invert the, the salvation narrative of Christianity. Uh, for no longer does liberation or salvation come through participation in the divinity of Christ, but what Gallagher calls a sham human autodivinization. We see this similar, uh, similar kind of strong position uh, being advanced by, uh, by David Hart, uh, an American theologian, who describes transhumanism and Christianity as defined by what he calls an irreconcilable hostility between two religions, two metaphysics, two worlds, and two gods. And so like Gallagher, Hart focuses on the impulse within uh, transhumanism to seize or to arrogate uh, to humanity the divine prerogative. So transhumanism expands what, what Hart calls modern humanity's Baconian mastery over cosmic nature to then encompass human nature as well, granting us absolute power over the flesh. So Hart then goes on to identify this, this transhumanist impulse, this philosophy, as resting on a basic rejection of dignity itself. Dignity, which, which Hart wants to uh, present as, as an invention, in his words, an invention or a discovery of Christianity, is slowly destroyed and replaced by something which he calls a more realistic or nihilistic uh, alternative. So transhumanism then becomes the embodiment of this deeper uh, cultural malaise or, or even cultural incoherence. So what I want to do now is to move from these, these rather uh, kind of broad stroke introductions to, to two dueling dignities, to looking at how they find expression within three aspects of, of human life, human experience that I think illuminate with, with a particular kind of poignancy what is really uh, at stake and at issue and what divides these, uh, these worldviews. And again, these, these uh, categories will be notions of embodiment or, or, or the body, uh, the concept of risk and, uh, and relationality. So let me begin with, uh, with embodiment. And uh, the questions that I want to, to take up here are, are really, really as follows. What respect is, is due to the body as such? And does the body matter? How does the body matter? And I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that for much of transhumanist thought, the body is not essential. It might be that we remain tethered in, in some way to bodies, uh, but the line between the human and the cyborg is, is blurry, as is, as is for that matter, our experience of, of embodiment itself. And so things like sex dolls and social media all point in their own ways in the direction of new ways of being human and of experiencing embodiment, and for that matter, disembodiment. And so we are already living in a world filled with what Francesca Ferrando calls alternative embodiments. Now, posthumanists give different perspectives. There's certainly a diversity of approaches on this question of whether this, this imagined posthumanity will need bodies at all. 
Uh, but there's certainly, I think, a more or less general agreement that we are undergoing a paradigm shift in the ontological or epistemological status of the human body. And in a theme that I think is very reminiscent of, of what I discussed earlier, the body becomes not itself a site of dignity, but really of limit. It's a limitation to the achievement or the actualization of limity, of, 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 of dignity. It thus becomes an object of manipulation and will, right? Dignity being something that is achieved, that is imposed, that is worked out. Um, and the body is the site of this reworking. The body is something that needs to be improved upon, its limitations, something that need to be overcome. And so there's almost an inevitable Gnostic quality to, to much of transhumanist thought. And thought, it is the mind, the noetic capabilities of, of the human person that are essential. And these can in some sense be dissociated from our, our enfleshment. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, uh, one of the uh, sort of the godfathers of, of, of this mode of thought, wrote uh, about 15 years ago that we will continue to have human bodies, but they will become morphable projections of our intelligence, of our mind. Ultimately, software based humans will be vastly extended beyond the severe limitations of humans as we know them today. Now, I, I think it's important to note, and this is a theme that I will come back to in a moment, but both Christianity and post-humanism see the body as a site of transformation and uh, possibility. Um, for both of these traditions, I, I want to propose human destiny lies in some sense beyond the human. Right? Bodies are to be transformed. That is the, that's the telos, the end of, of, of these worldviews. But the Christian vision of the transformed body is not one of ultimate disembodiment of, of, of moving beyond the body. Rather, embodiment remains constitutive of what it is to be a transformed human. And this, I think, is the fundamental point of tension with post-human thought. Uh, as, as Hava Tiro Samuelson points out, the, the, what she calls the eschatological anthropology of post-humanism is not participation in the divine trinity, but rather to be uploaded onto a supercomputer. So there remains the fact then that for Christianity, nature is transcended and transformed as an act of grace, whereas for transhumanists, it is transformed through human conquest and will. The second theme I wanna talk about is, is risk. Um, and, and, and especially the different ways in which risk is understood or, or experienced. And at the, at the most basic, what I want to propose is that, uh, again, post-humanism and religion adopt different positions towards notions of dominion, of mastery, of control, all things that are related in some sense to the concept and to the experience of risk. And the post-human project aims to exert a kind of mastery over the body, over the environment, and over experience that can't but be read in some sense as an attempt to control and to overcome um, the vicissitudes of what it means to, to be human. Uh, Anta Jacqueline uh, categorizes the, what she, what she frames as the three different um, aims of transhumanism as repair, enhancement, and overcoming. So repair would be artificial limbs. Uh, enhancement would be implantation of chips in the brain or genetic manipulation. And overcoming would be something like the uploading of minds, the digital immortality. So we have different gradations of what is, is entailed. But in all of these respects, the, the project of post-humanism is animated in some sense by a pursuit for perpetual improvement of human nature. Improvements that might finally overcome the ultimate limits of human nature, which is death. Uh, according to the, to the Transhumanist Manifesto, transhumanism affirms what is described as the desirability of fundamentally improving the human condition by developing and making widely available technologies to eliminate aging, to enhance human intellect, physical, and psychological capacities. So the human person and the natural world are identified again as sources of limitation, of loci of, of suffering, 
And technology assumes this, this salvific role of offering a means of overcoming the primal chaos of evolution by, by controlling and manipulating the destiny of the human future. And so to eliminate this chaos and this risk is to make life fundamentally more dignified. Now, Max Moore, who, who is describing what he calls the transhumanist philosophy, argues that it is a misconception to see transhumanists as seeking to eliminate risk. And he writes that, quote, transhumanists seek not utopia, but merely perpetual progress. If the posthuman project is successful, we may no longer suffer some of the miseries that have plagued human existence. But this is not reason to expect life to be free of risks, dangers, conflict, and struggle. I think this is a, I mean, it's an interesting uh, proposition. And, and while we might quibble over what is meant by uh, perpetual progress, uh, by risk and by danger, I ultimately find this position, this sort of his demural on the point of risk to be a bit publishing, uh, puzzling. Uh, because at base, it still seems that the post-humanist project has as its final aim, the cultivation of a form of control over the self and of life, whether that be in terms of biological capabilities over gender and sexuality, over experiences of pleasure and happiness or over death. And so the transhumanist self is increasingly seeking to free itself from these limitations. Uh, perhaps we might even better say the, the vulnerabilities that are indissociable from, uh, from human nature. And perhaps, right, perhaps this doesn't entail a life free in some totalizing sense of risk, of danger, of conflict, of struggle. But it can't be denied that it remains desirable to eliminate these as much as possible. The notion of risk, as I've described it within uh, posthumanist thought, opens an important cleavage with its religious counterpart. Uh, David Hart, again, uh, describes posthumanism as seeking to exert control over the flesh and what is born of it, banishing all fortuity and uncertainty from the, hu from the future of the human race. And this idea that posthumanism is driven by this, by this an unhinged impulse to control and to master nature and the self is, is a frequent theme that is uh, expressed by religious critics. It, it's what Brandon Gallagher describes as the pursuit of dominion of the human race over the universe. And by so doing, by seeking this end, humanity arrogates to itself the divine prerogative. Humans do not need God because the things that make us dependent, dependent creatures, prone to risk, can ultimately be mastered and overcome. The human can be controlled by going beyond the human, by making creatures into, into gods. And as such, this project seeks to overcome many of the contingencies that are built into the fabric of human life and to realize a technological eschaton. Now, this, this critical perspective not only advances a claim about the hubris of science, but I think also embedded within it is a normative claim about what makes for a dignified human existence. So it is argued that insofar as posthumanism envisages this world containing a kind of perfection, or at least a continuous pursuit of perfection, a world without risk, is one which destroys something which is most essential to our humanity. And so this quest to bring human nature under mastery with the aim of limiting vulnerability, paradoxically it is proposed, brings about a kind of unfreedom. Uh, Hans Jonas remarks that technological mastered nature now again includes man who up to now had in technology set himself against it as its master. And I think this is a, this is a quite uh, intriguing proposition which seems to propose as its, as its conclusion that the master has now become mastered. That is, without risk, there cannot be freedom. That is, only from a position of some kind of vulnerability is it possible to fully experience our humanness. So this vulnerability, this, this, this capacity for risk, uh, in it lies something that is essential to the experience and the outworking of dignity. 
Lastly, the uh, the third category that I want to to look at is is what I'm calling uh, relationality. And and what I mean by relationality is is simply the the question of how the self relates to other persons, and and one might add also God, and how the experience of selfhood is shaped and informed through these relations. For certain thinker, thinkers. Uh, the the technological transformation of the self creates new and enhanced capacities for relationality. I think this is this is a quite interesting theme that that you see in a number of uh, transhumanist writers. So Rud Termulin proposes, for instance, that enhanced human beings should be able to connect with other human beings. They should be able, he argues, to develop human relationships that are essential for their individuality and he adds their dignity. I can't even imagine, he writes, that technology that technologies can promote an improved dignity. I'm sorry, cannot promote an improved dignity by supporting dialogue and human understanding. So there's something about uh, this vision of the enhanced human in its capabilities that is dignity enhancing through its enhanced capacity to engage others. Along similar lines, uh, uh, another uh, group of commentators have proposed that cognitive enhancement will, will improve human relationships by improving our capacity for empathy, for concern, and for cooperative capabilities. Right? So, so there's this, this line of argument that, um, that the relational aspect of human dignity is enhanced, not diminished, by pushing against the boundaries of our inherited nature. Now, it's not particularly clear from, from these writings what relationality might mean for an enhanced human. And it's also not clear whether such humans would need to be, in some sense, in relation. All that these thinkers have really attempted to maintain is that there exists in some meaningful way a notion of, let's call it, transhuman relationality. The, the challenge is, I think, this claim uh, exists in some tension with the fundamentally atomistic anthropology of posthumanism more generally. The individual qua individual remains the basic unit of meaning and of analysis. More to the point, dignity and flourishing exist only in relation to the self, and there is no necessary recourse to relation with the other as a condition of dignity. Indeed, I think we can even kind of push this line of inquiry further and propose that part of the telos of the post-humanist project is to envision a self turned in fully on the self. Russell Blackford describes transhumanism as a philosophy of what he calls self-transformation and self-overcoming. And, and the way that he uses this language of the self, especially this phrase self-overcoming, is revealing because it seems to posit self as both subject and object. There is no necessary other. That is, the self is made dignified only through overcoming its own limits. Now, whereas uh, this, this strand of, of transhumanist thought connects uh, uh, dignity with a turning inward, religious thought has tended to emphasize the opposite. That is a connection between selfhood and a turning outward. Uh, Ronald Cole Turner, in, in, in an interesting essay on Christianity and transhumanism, notes that Christians find ourselves called to lose ourselves, a kind of Augustinian theme, to lose ourselves in relation with God. For Christians, the individual human transcendence is not so much in passing beyond the self, but a passing into God. So to kind of work with this idea that, 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 that Cole Turner is proposing, the self is achieved through relationship through being in communion. Thus to have and to exhibit dignity is to have the capacity to be in relation, to be in relation with creation, to be in relation with other persons, ultimately to be in relation with God. Now there are, you can see, two, two fundamentally different notions of creaturehood that are, are, are in operation here. For post-human thought, the self seeks autonomy, independence from the limits of our creatureliness, including dependence on others. 
Yet many religious responses stress the idea that we are dependent creatures, always necessarily dependent creatures, created by God, dependent on God, no matter how much of nature can be mastered. And this dependency in turn becomes an invitation to participation. Now, I've just got a couple of minutes left, so let me, uh, let me conclude by offering uh, some, some, some final thoughts about where all of this leaves us. Right? So, so, so I've proposed that we have these kind of dueling dignitarian worldviews that, that are both expressed in uh, sort of general uh, uh, philosophical orientation and also which find expression in these, in these different sites of, of, of human life, these different contested sites of human experience. So where does, where does this leave us? Uh, let, me, let me propose uh, the following, that it seems to me that we can discern uh, within these, these differing anthropologies the extent to which the post-human project remains deeply tethered to modernity. Tethered in a way perhaps that accelerates and, and even aims to fulfill in the fullest logical sense its moral ambitions, but it remains fundamentally grounded in, um, in, in the modern experience. And, and there's a kind of interesting paradox that, that even as it aims to envision the human future, it finds its, infer, in, it, it finds its, its inspiration in the inheritance of, of the past. And, and I would propose perhaps even, even further that, 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 that the aspect of modernity that, that really animates much of posthumanism is what is called expressive individualism, a term that was originally coined some decades ago by, by Robert Bella, the American sociologist, and which has been appropriated in, in some quite interesting ways more recently by, by Carter Sneed in his work on, on public bio, bioethics. As Sneed summarizes this notion of expressive individualism in, in its pristine form, he writes that it takes the individual, uh, the atomized self to be the fundamental unit of human reality. The expressive uh, individualized self is defined then by such characteristics as the primacy of choice, of authenticity, the privileging of mind over body, the, 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 the evasion of, of vulnerability. And while Sneed is, is exploring these themes in connection with, with, with American legal debates and bioethics, I think we can, can quite uh, usefully uh, extend this line of analysis to, to interrogate what seems to be animating the post-human project. And lastly, let me conclude by, by just considering two uh, related questions. Are we, sort of, sort of given what, what I've proposed, are we simply left with two incompatible anthropologies, two dignities that are and will remain ineluctably oppositional. And by extension, maybe we can ask, is religion simply destined to operate as an oppositional voice on the margins of this conversation about the human future, reinforcing yet again a certain kind of religion science binary? It's, it's well established that, that religion is, is a marginalized dynamic within transhuman conversations. There, there have been some, uh, some demographic studies and uh, huge majorities, 90 plus percent of self-identified transhumanists disclaim uh, any religious interest or, uh, or, or, or affiliation. Uh, but I think it's actually the, the sort of the antithesis goes even deeper than that. It's not simply about um, individual affiliation, but it's a perception that the project of posthumanism is, uh, in Bostrom's phrasing, uh, an outgrowth of secular humanism and the Enlightenment. And religion becomes framed as, as a barrier, a barrier to achieving human enhancement. Why? Because I think it is framed, and you see this, uh, this, this kind of theme emerging over and again, it is framed as being wed to this static, inviolable account of human nature. Or if we want to put it on dignitary terms, as seeing dignity as this fixed human quality embedded in nature as such. And if that's the case, perhaps the dignitarian divide is, is too great to overcome. But I at least want to put on the table for, for consideration some interesting theological perspectives that are being developed 
that try in various ways to foster a more constructive encounter between modes of religious thought and certain themes within uh, post-human thought that try to go beyond this idea that religion can do nothing more than uh, than offer this sort of defined no. It, it's, it's, it's perhaps important, important to add that nor should religion, at least in these phrasings, offer a kind of uncritical yes either. And the theme, the interesting theme that you start to see running through a lot of, of thinkers that are pursuing a project of this sort, this kind of third way, is to see within uh, strands of transhumanism and strands of Christian thought a common notion of what we might describe as, as being as becoming. That is this idea that there is in both Christianity and post-humanism a story of humanity transformed, a story of human nature as an ongoing work in progress. And so this, this kind of theme then uh, stands in, in, in some significant point of tension with this notion of nature as, as normative. Rather, in, in, in the interesting framing of, uh, of Catherine Tanner, the theologian Catherine Tanner, nature has a plasticity. And, and this plasticity, we might say in theological terms, has a telos, which is participation in, in divine life. It is a process, it is a progress. And so for, for Ronald Cole Term, uh, uh, Turner, the problem then isn't what transhumanism imagines in terms of the transformation of humanity. It's rather that, 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 that transhumanism doesn't go far enough. It, it's, it's too limited in, in its moral imagination. Uh, to put this, uh, Ted Peters, another writer in this area, makes, makes a similar point by saying that transhumanism cannot in the end offer eschatological fulfillment. It can only offer a more limited, um, uh, sort of domesticated account of human transformation. And so what you see going on in this line of inquiry is, is something of a reinterpretation of the post-human future, a, a, a re-narration within a theological context of what post-humanity might mean. And this approach, interestingly, doesn't simply reject technology as envisaged as satanic, to, to, to invoke Gallagher's term, but instead tries to offer a different account of what humanity's technological future might mean by way of its moral significance. And so I don't want to overstate in, in some sort of facile way the difficulties of overcoming these deep anthropological and dignitarian divides that, that continue to endure. But uh, these differences aside, we have at least here the potentiality of, of an interesting point of contact and one that, that finds as its, as, its, as its nexus point common appeals to the human yearning to transcend our, our givenness. And, and I think if we can sort of identify this point of understanding, there might then be at least the possibility for a more uh, fruitful uh, engagement about the moral aims of technology as it relates to human nature uh, and to human flourishing. And, uh, and so with that, I will uh, bring my remarks to a close and uh, look forward to our conversation. Okay, thank you very much, Zachary, for this very, very insightful, insightful presentation. And it's now question and answer time. So if any, if any one of you has any question, please turn on your mic and go on. Anyone? Always a good sign. Okay. Okay, so it's it's up to me to break the ice, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, well, again, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I've never heard about this, about this post-human dignity uh, idea. I'm quite naive in this topic. And as uh, in the same way, I'd like to put on the table for consideration this issue. What I was thinking, actually, is the following. Uh, some would say that, well, human overpopulation continues to be a pressing problem for the well-being of people. And this, and this is in terms of increased demand for resources, such as, I mean, fresh water, food, 
there are issues linked to starvation, malnutrition, and of course, um, overpopulation could be linked to some neg negative aspects in terms of decreased jobs opportunity. And we know that current legal and political frameworks actually would say, human rights, political and legal frameworks would say that and would support the right to work as something deeply linked to human dignity. So my question would be, what would be, what would say uh, supporters of post-human dignity on this issue? What would be their own take about the issue linked to overpopulation? I don't know if, if this makes sense. Um, this is what came to my mind. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Um, you're going to make me get real here really, really quickly. Um, let me try to fumble my way through 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 some thoughts. Um, and I'm going to do that classic pivot of, of saying thank you for your question. And now I'm going to I'm going to pull it in a, in a in a direction where I might have something more to say, which is which is perhaps looking for, perhaps asking this this variation of your question, which is. How might this debate about dignity that 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 I've identified occurring within the sphere of, of biotechnology or kind of anthropology inform the debate about dignity in in these other spheres, uh, in particular within the context of, of 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 human rights, which is where I think I mean, which is really where I, I think most of us encounter dignity as a as a moral and and a political vocabulary is, 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 is in the legal and, and the political sphere. Um, so that's, I, I, I hope I haven't drifted too far from, from your question, but, but, I, but I'm trying to kind of remain authentic to it while, while putting on the table something that, that as, I, as I kind of think through this in my own mind is, is, is an interesting proposition. Um, I, I mean, as many of you have perhaps encountered, I mean, I mean, dignity, I'm, I'm trying to, it, it was, um, the fellow at uh, the, the neuroscientist at, at Harvard, I'm, I'm forgetting his name, um, but had this famous article some years ago where he, where, where he described dignity as, as a meaningless concept, that, that dignity is used everywhere. It means everything to anybody, that, that it ceases to have any kind of useful currency within spheres of deliberation, whether that be uh, bioethics or whether that be uh, law and public morality and, and human rights. And I guess the question I might ask is, does this kind of determined reflection about the human person feed in some way into our capacity to talk more meaningfully about dignity in these quite concrete ways? Uh, you gave the example of, of population, of the right to food, of the right to, to work, et cetera. I framed the question, to, 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 be, to be honest, I'm not quite sure I, I, I have much of an answer to <laughs> To offer, I, I'm kind of kind of running into a bit of a wall here, um, yeah. in part because, to, to, to be honest, I'm I'm actually quite suspicious of dignity in 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 in, in the sphere of international human rights. Um, in in that, I think the language, as I would read it, has become so deeply invested with a kind of political vocabulary that I'm not sure it actually has much in the way of anthropological significance. It, it does seem to me, and maybe this is a partial answer, it does seem to me that what is happening in the debates that I've looked at is there actually is a real and determined contestation about dignity as such as an anthropological debate about first order principles. I think, I, I do think it's fair to say that's going on is there's a deep contest about nature and flourishing and, hum and, and human goods in a way that I actually think has been evacuated from the legal sphere of human rights, which, you know, this is, this is my own uh, somewhat prejudiced perspective, but, but, but as I mentioned, I'm, I'm just deeply suspicious that dignity in international law especially has much in the way of moral meaning, but is really kind of a, a, a political sledgehammer. And if that's the case, then, then, then perhaps this site of deliberation offers the possibility for a kind of um, um, uh, re sort of adding nutrition to to um, to that conversation. That was a that was a bit of a roundabout answer that 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 ultimately said very little about population, but but I hope it can can at least get us um, get us started. Well, 
It's brilliant, thank you. And I deeply agree with you about the political side of human rights and international law. But however, and however this might be, we have a question in the chat box by Chris Moran, and I hope I've not misspelled the name. So please, Chris, go on, it's your turn. Uh, perhaps you should turn on your mic. That would be helpful. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, Zach. Good to see you. Uh, Chris from Acton Institute. It's, it's been about uh, probably probably about 20 years since we would have seen I, each other I, in, in Grand Rapids. So we should have a proper reconnect. But very nice to very nice to see you here. Well, thank you for the this presentation. I've kind of been a little bit of a bystander. There are lots of people on my team who are engaged in these issues. Uh, and this was a very helpful overview uh, for me. Um, my question is many religionists, and this includes some of my own colleagues, are exhausted uh, by what they see as the usurpation of the term dignity um, by the transhumanists. And they are now actively discouraging even use of the term. And this, of course, seeds the field to one side only, the transhumanists. Uh, so I guess my question is, is the term lost <laughs> to one side? Uh, and, or, and or what do you say to those who are, and they're often the religionists, now abandoning the term altogether? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chris. I mean, there's a lot, lot of interesting things we could, we could unpack there. A um, couple of thoughts. Um, I, I, I mean, I actually think this problem that you've identified as occurring within this sphere we're discussing is 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 a much um, bigger problem, which is uh, if you want to kind of kind of uh, play off of uh, Alistair McIntyre's um, book of some years ago, whose justice, whose rationality, we could say, you know, who, whose dignity, you know, what 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 does dignity actually mean, particularly as a public discourse. And I, I'm certainly willing to comfortably adopt the position that that dignity has become so unmoored from any kind of common sense of its meaning that it is, in fact, largely meaningless as a political vocabulary. So insofar as aspects of uh, this debate over biotechnology is a, a, a deliberation about public goods, then I would concur that I'm not sure dignity is really going to get us anywhere. Um, to your point about dignity being sort of captured by the, um, by the transhumanists, I, I think again, we could, I, could, I could say yes and push that point even further and say that I think dignity has become um, not only evacuated as a, as a, as a kind of common deliberative discourse, but has become, you know, to, to use the phrase I mentioned a moment ago, a kind of, of political sledgehammer. Um, you know, you see this, for instance, in, uh, I, I've been doing some work recently on the use of dignity in constitutional jurisprudence in debates about uh, LGBT rights in Canada, in the US, in the UK, and in Australia. And dignity is, is invoked by everybody on every position to the point that it means absolutely nothing. And, and I think we've kind of run into that problem. And one reason we've run into that problem is, you know, when dignity first entered as a kind of political vocabulary with the post-World War II um, international settlement, you know, the, the sort of minimalistic use of dignity in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's now become, I think, a kind of political vocabulary that encompasses whatever anybody seeks to define as a good as a political thing, as a political aim that should receive legal imprimatur. And once we've reached that point, then we're just battling over dignities, not goods. Now that said, I, I, would, I would pull back a little bit though with respect to the kinds of issues I'm discussing and at least be a little more hesitant to abandon the discourse of dignity. And here's why, because if you're, if you're entering into this deliberation from uh, for instance, like some of your colleagues from 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 a, a religious perspective, then I think in fact there is value in um, reclaiming dignity, not so much as a as a contested term to 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 win some dignitary battle, 
but rather to use dignity as a point of entry into a more defined discourse about theological anthropology. So I guess I would propose that that part of the solution isn't to give up on dignity, but rather to vest it with a more um, particularistic kind of meaning. But the, the spheres in which that might be a useful tactic are probably not going to be public and political, but perhaps much more so um, deliberative and, and theological. So that, uh, but, but we, we could say a lot more. I think it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant question in which there is much, um, much embedded. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. That was a very interesting point. We have another question by Lucia. So please, Lucia. Yes, uh, hi, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, Lucia, yes. Okay, hi, I, I'm sorry. Uh, my question regards a uh, uh, debate uh, that was at stake in the announcement discussion about the, the promise uh, to, uh, of having uh, smarter, faster, more empathic uh, human beings. And so at some point, uh, people participated into the debate thought maybe we will obtain at some point uh, a nation of angels. So I, I, I was wondering, uh, can we consider that uh, the sense of dignity could change uh, if we are humans versus if we became angels? It's more a provocation than um, a real question, but there is a little bit this idea. How can we enlarge our or enhance our condition and what does it mean uh, if we would, be, would become as angels? And thank you for the great contribution. Thank you, Lucia. This is a this is a variation about the uh, the angels on the on the head of a pin that I've that I've never never much thought about um, the dignitary status of celestial beings. Um, you know, I, I I guess to to kind of circle back to to a theme I mentioned earlier, the answer to that question might well depend on uh, even if we kind of put. Let, let's sort of put aside the the language of the angelic and simply talk about even even more generally enhanced humans in in some in some capacity and in some form through some means. I think the answer to this question, which 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 uh, you know, opens up uh, some deeper vessels of inquiry, really depends on whether one views dignity as a status or a process. And certainly, there there would be. Uh, um, Many thinkers, uh, certainly of the of, of the transhumanist variety, who who would answer a defined yes, because of course, um, to become bigger and better and faster and stronger and smarter is to become, by definition, more dignified. You know, dignity dignity exists in this in this um, correlative relationship with capabilities. Um, if one adopts a somewhat more static view. Uh, of dignity, then, then I think you could unpack this in a couple of ways. One could either say that, well, dignity hasn't changed, capabilities have, or one could say dignity has been harmed by virtue of um, uh, diminishing something which is essential to to our humanness by 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 doing these very things. Um, there, perhaps, you know, to to kind of play with the different possibilities, the. The mode of theological inquiry with which I, I ended, I think, offers yet another possibility, which is to see dignity as a both and. That is to see dignity as something which is given to humans as such as gift. So there is both a static quality to our humanity that must inform the way that we think about all of these interventions. But at the same time, we can also envision. Um, the transformation of humanity through technology insofar as it can be narrated as a kind of human participation in a divine process as also at the same time dignity enhancing. So I think one could, could creatively see a dignity no, a dignity yes, and a dignity both and. Uh, just because this this comes to mind, it's a bit of a variation on on your question, but something that I think it's important to just to put onto the table. 
uh, because it brings together both some of these technological questions, but also the human rights questions, is is a concern that that is being raised, you know, more at the moment as a as a theoretical proposition. But I think it's not all that difficult to envision uh, a world in the not too distant future where this becomes very much a, a, a real situation. Is the problem of let's call it inequality of capabilities that raises dignitary questions. Um, a, a kind of social justice question, if you want to put it on those terms, between um, those who have the means to pursue enhancement and those who do not, and, and those who have um, the uh, moral will to pursue enhancements and those who will not do to moral objections. And I think we have some very complicated questions that arise both by virtue of um, uh, where sort of morality and um, equality begin to to intersect. And I think, you know, we need to begin wrestling with questions of, of a world that is divided along various axes uh, of, 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 of these terms. Um, so uh, again, kind of kind of pushing your question a little bit further, but but where dignity and biotechnology and human rights meet is 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 is, is something that is is very real in uh, in our future, I believe. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm now passing the floor again to Boris for a last and final question. Thank you very much, Zachary, for this uh, uh, talk. That's great. Um, I was, um, I'm not sure it's a question. It's, it's um, a different um, kind of angle, maybe, to, to approach the, the discussion that you framed about um, dignity and the possible um, points of, of or the, the points of divergence and the possible points of contact between, let's say, Christian anthropology and and the kind of anthropology that's driving uh, transhumanist thought, uh, basically. Um, I mean, the, the approach would be this: when you look at at uh, the writings of of uh, transhumanists, um, so the those posthumanists that um, um, emphasize the technological aspect of uh, reaching the post-human condition, because there are other kinds of post-humanism which, which do not have this heavy emphasis on technology, uh, like what, what is now called critical trans, uh, sorry, critical post-humanism. So, yeah. but when you look at transhumanist writing, then there is, then there is a, a, a subtle shift uh, semantically, of course, enhancement and improvement are somehow close, but even though it's not the same. So, um, I mean, you can enhance a capacity that is, uh, whose enhancement is not deemed uh, an improvement in the bigger picture. So the, the, the debate seems to be about what counts as improvement. Mm -hmm. So can these kinds of technological, um, technological enhancements that transhumanists um, envisage uh, can they really count as improvements in a, in a, in a, in a broader uh, uh, scheme of in the broader scheme of things? I mean, who? It's it's kind of it's kind of rhetorics. Um, I mean, who would object to improving? Who would object to improving our condition? Well, at first glance, no one. The question then is what what counts as improvement? And uh, to to my mind, the the debates. Um, um, uh, many debates uh, within post and transhumanist thought, but also with uh, religious thought, philosophical thought. You mentioned Nick Bostrom and so on. They are, in the end, they are about, about that concept. It's more, what, what should we, what kind of uh, society, what kind of world do we want to live in? <laughs> so, and this is so deeply normative. So, yeah. so that, 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 that's less. So, what do you th have? Do you have thoughts on this? Yeah. No. No. I mean, this is um, this, this is a really. Uh, Great and interesting question, and 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 I, and I guess I would I would offer this just to to kind of put something on the table. I I think there's actually a um, a coherent distinction that could be offered on some level between enhancement and improvement, and and I would concur that that the themes that I discussed and and, and kind of these these more um, intense points of tension lie with with what we want to call improvement, quote unquote. Um, and to your point, who objects to enhancement? Well, you know, we already live, of course, in, in an era of enhancement, right? I mean, who would object to the proposition of um, uh, military pilots having enhanced um, 
eyesight. Um, who would object perhaps to, I mean, you know, athletes enhance themselves in all kinds of, of subtle ways. Um, you know, it doesn't even have to be steroidal, but but you just think about the the ways in which technologies, quote unquote, right? So just the um, impact the way that we that we train athletes. I mean, that that's a kind of enhancement in a certain sense that that most people don't deem objectionable, right? The 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 the, the manipulation of diet, uh, professional sports teams hiring uh, sleep consultants to try to maximize and enhance human capabilities. Um, so, so all that to say, I mean, I think there is this a, a, a line at at the kind of level of theoretical categorization that we could draw, um, and it's probably worth drawing. I guess my hesitation is is twofold. That um, one is, I think, the line between enhancement and improvement is now and will increasingly become fuzzy and indeterminate to the point that the line isn't all that meaningful. And that much of what we talk about as enhancement is already beginning to touch on, in a certain structural way, improvement. And so to the extent that we want to have conversations about um, uh, sort of enhancements of the sort that I described, Right. Enhancing athletic performance by putting your body in an oxygen deprivation chamber so you be, can become uh, a more effective long distance runner. Hiring a sleep consultant. That, that how we want to deal with these kinds of issues ethically strikes me, at least at this stage, as being more a matter of prudential judgment than philosophical principle. But very quickly, you start to move to areas where I think the debate necessarily needs to turn more on principle. And once you arrive at that stage, I'm not sure this distinction really, even if still cognizable as, as a theoretical proposition, really does much work. Um, so that's kind of my way of saying yes, but. Thank you very much, Zachary. Um, so, well, yeah, uh, Matteo, you... Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, this was intense, but I think that our time is up. So I'm passing again the floor to you for final remarks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, thank you very much again for participating. Um, thank you, of course, uh, in the first place um, to uh, Zachary for this very, very interesting talk. Um, let me give you the link to the webinar series website again. Uh, I just posted it in the chat. Our next um, our next uh, episode will be on February the 10th with uh, Nahum Dershowitz, uh, a computer scientist from the University of Tel Aviv. Um, thank you very much again, uh, Zachary. I hope to uh, sooner or later welcome you in Trento <laughs> and uh, hope to see you all soon again. Uh, and we'll let you know about the platform um, if we uh, have to migrate uh, uh, for good to Google Teams or can go back to, uh, sorry, to, to Microsoft Teams or can go back to Google Meet. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Boris. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night.